Okay. Hi. <laughs> this is Work in Progress. We are your co-hosts for the day. My name is Chase Joint. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Gender Studies at the University of Victoria. And I'm Michelle Jakes, the head of exhibitions and collections and chief curator at Rainy Modern in Saskatoon. This podcast series is programmed through the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria and is generously supported by a Canada Council for the Arts Digital Now grant. The AGGV is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nation. Work in Progress is a podcast that offers some insight from behind the scenes to curatorial projects that could be seen as process based, highlighting some of the experimental work that is taking shape inside and outside of the AGGV's physical gallery spaces, such as the Feminist Art Field School. The Feminist Art Field School, or FAFS, as some of our students like to call it, was an online course that took place during the fall semester of 2021 and was geared towards students, artists, curators, and community members interested in gender, feminism, and the porous boundaries between art, activism, and academic practice. Our hope is that this podcast episode will help extend the conversations that began in the Feminist Art Field School and will be a way to share some insights from behind the scenes more broadly with family, friends, and communities who might want to learn more. And so, you know, perhaps we should start by briefly summarizing the field school for listeners who might not know anything about it. And it strikes me that your recent anecdote talking about our participation in this podcast might be a useful place to begin. Yeah, it's interesting because I was um, telling uh, a colleague here that that I was doing this podcast with you and the AGGV today. Um, I said it was a podcast about the Feminist Art Field School. I had always thought that we had so didactically named the course that it was um, really obvious to everybody what it was all about. But the first two questions were, what is a field school? And what was feminist about it? Um, so I wonder if you want to take uh, the first question, what is a field school? Uh, it is something that, that UVic actually um, offers quite a bit in different departments. Yeah, I love those questions. And in some ways, if the people listening had access to our syllabus, they would see that we, from the beginning, are troubling the terms of the engagement. What is feminism? What is field? What is land? What is territory? What is school? What is pedagogy? What is teaching? These are the sort of central questions and obsessions of, of our time together. And the field school for the purposes of course booking at the University of Victoria, not to get too in the weeds, is a way to signal an opportunity for students to be outside of traditional classroom space. So this can look like leaving and studying in a different geographic location. But for the purposes of our work, it was about an institutional collaboration between arts sectors and academic institutions. And, you know, one of the things that I loved about my time with you is that we realized through our various disciplinary access points and positions that we were both troubling over the same questions and thinking about the role of institutions and the role of teaching and how art moves in and out of those spaces. And so for me, field school is an opportunity to think about expanding the terms of our learning and leaving the bounds of traditional academic space. What about you? It's interesting um, that when we first started talking about the field school, it was going to be a learning opportunity in a different geographic space, at least different from the university campus. Because we started the planning before the pandemic hit, we had imagined that we would be bringing people to Victoria and that a lot of the work would happen, I guess, around the physical space of the AGGB and other spaces outside of the classroom. And then what it transformed into was a sort of, you know, it, it was a virtual space, obviously, the, the program was delivered um, online. But for me, it, it always sort of maintained a real sort of connection to the idea of being a field school, because our weekly guests were always talking about the larger world and a larger experience and connecting what the students were learning to to real life 
experience. I think we even started calling my little presentations every week notes from, from the field. So it also, uh, for me, connected the term connected to the, the way we were bringing together the experience of the museum world, the art world, hopefully in a, a kind of radical interpretation of what those fields could be into the, the virtual classroom and giving students a taste of art beyond the textbook. You know, and I think it's also about the classroom beyond the lecture. I think one of the things that I was so inspired to think about with you is how to really democratize the various platforms of our engagement. And so part of the structure of the class, inviting conversation based modules with artists and cultural producers to think with us out loud about their practice meant that students were arriving to continue a conversation that was already in process. And I loved the notes from the field because in part you were able to offer to many students who had less experience in more traditional formal arts institutions, some of the ways in which we come to recognize collecting or labeling or these processes that go often under interrogated by those who are, are less frequently a part of those spaces. And I think it's through our ability to spend time with you that we, we were able to reinterrogate some of the structures of academia and institutional learning, which are also formalized and serve as exclusive spaces that are about certain kinds of learning and certain kinds of histories. And so there was a kind of organic way in which disrupting the traditional classroom space opened up new possibilities for learning and creative institutional critique and deep colonial practice and thinking. Absolutely. And I'm not sure if it's if it's too soon to move off of uh, our discussion about uh, the idea of the field school um, towards a discussion of what was feminist about it. But one of the other sort of threads that I feel um, ran through the course for me was that I was always thinking back to my experience of being in the post-secondary classroom. And um, I did my graduate work in the early 90s at a time when, at least at York University, a lot of professors were being encouraged to introduce feminist practice to the syllabus. And it most often appeared as, you know, the last week or two on the syllabus. It was sort of like very awkwardly presented and always seemed sort of, it was, it was presented as though it was this kind of thing that was happening elsewhere. It wasn't integrated into everything else that we were, were doing. And then, um, you know, the other post-secondary experience that I think of is when I was a sessional teaching Canadian art history at OCAD in the mid 2000s. And I was completely perplexed by the idea of a three hour lecture course in Canadian art history. And I always thought that I was cheating the institution of what they were paying me to do. Because I would go into the classroom and ask questions and see how long I could get the students talking before I actually had to deliver any content myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love this admission. <laughs> and now I understand that, you know, that's actually a feminist practice to absolutely not take up all of the space. Um, so sh shoot, how did I get there? Where was I going with that? I guess um, just thinking about how, how the course was feminist. I feel like it was feminist in so many ways in the structure of the course, in the way the students were engaged, in the way opportunities to contribute were democratized, and in the way that feminist art, feminist thinking, feminist activism was uh, central to the discussions every week through the readings and through our contributions, and um, especially through the selection of the guest speakers. Yeah, you know. Feminism is such an unstable and contested term. And one of the things that I loved so much about our conversations was to, to think with our various interlocutors and participants about its use value. 
what are the ways in which feminism serves as useful as an analytic tool as a space of activist grounding and where what are the ways in which we need to discard feminism and feminist practice or feminist history in service of other more usable ways of thinking and being in the world and you know i really love your anecdote about showing up to a classroom and trying to suspend for as long as possible the the need to lecture or the need to bring in your own opinion and there's something really exciting about the field school model which i think charges every participant in the room to actively curate and create their learning and that's not to say there aren't guides and support systems in place along the way to support students, but rather to say that the field school is only ever going to be about its participants. And so one of the things that I love is we could use the same material, we could offer up the same lecture pods to a different room and the field school would have a totally different tone and a totally different shape. And through our collaboration with the AGGV, one of the things that I'm left to think about as well is the way in which the field school endures long after our formal classroom space has come to a close. What does it mean to have a kind of public living pedagogical arm where the lecture pods are available for ongoing use and where there can be a kind of passive site of engagement for those who might want to sync up with us. To me too, that's an exciting moment of feminist practice, which is again, to think about how these institutions of which we are a part in arts and academic spaces are, are exclusive and are boundaried and are controlled. And how can we break down some of those barriers to access? Yeah, I have to admit that when when I entered into the conversation about um, working on this with you, I was assuming a much more kind of didactic, what's the word I'm looking for, obvious definition of feminism or feminist art than we ended up working with. I think by virtue of my age, I was a child during second wave feminism and that period of grad school that I talk about was a moment when people were working so hard to achieve gender parity in academia that I do tend to revert to a, a very kind of obvious definition and understanding of feminism. And one of the things that uh, had been in my head when we started talking was what was happening in, in museums and what really came into high focus during the pandemic and particularly during the Black Lives Matter movement and uprising after George, George Floyd's death. Um, there was a demand that museums behave differently. We finally saw hiring practices changing in, in museums. People were questioning choices about leadership. People were questioning inequities in what voices were heard in curatorial departments in museums. And also the people inside museums were making it really clear how things had to change, why things had to change, what kinds of oppressive practices were still taking place in museums. So I had this sort of very kind of, I don't know, maybe it was a little simplistic or something, but this idea that museums were in the, the process of shifting from their um, uh, old white male uh, persona to a new kind of way of being. And that's what was at the back of my mind as we were working through this course, sort of not that everything was being um, necessarily moving towards a new gendered identity, but that we were very much trying to shake that old gendered identity. Right. And so I have a question that's a little bit off topic, but it's related uh, to a discussion that I was having with people in the entertainment industry around diversity and the momentums coming out of the movement for Black Lives and the demand for structural change. 
and the ways in which, at least in some circuits of film and TV, the momentum and energy of the commitments of those in power to change their ways has waned. And I'm curious to know in sort of arts and museum sectors, uh, how you are thinking about those very same ideas and themes now, a few years in, and, and frankly, actually, uh, you know, almost a year after, after the field school, has the conversation changed? Has it taken on new shape? Where are those momentums? What's most exciting or interesting or concerning to you these days? I feel um, very lucky to be in an institution um, and there are others like it uh, that is being led by um, directors who are very committed to the idea of change. And this institution has um, been quite successful in ensuring that the governance body is on board, up to speed, capable of overseeing that kind of change. So the conversation is ramping up here mm. in terms of the issues and the kind of movement toward change being incorporated into governance documents, business documents, all of our policies and procedures, as well as our ways of working from day to day and decisions that we make about what we share with our communities. That said, every once in a while, it sort of comes back that somebody's been at some meeting somewhere where some other leader or individual from inside a museum has said, you know, like, isn't that over yet? When are, when are things going to swing back? So I, I think much like, much like politics, the museum sector has operated on this idea of a, a pendulum. And the hope was that this swing had been so far in one direction that change would really take hold. I guess it still remains to be seen whether the institutions that are really, really committed to that change can, can become the, the norm or the model. Right. And I mean, it's relevant to some of the broader questions that we were asking in the field school, which is to say, you know, are institutions actually capable of sustaining this kind of change while remaining the institutions that they are? And I'm really challenged and compelled by that question and its ongoing irresolvability. And I think it's really relevant to students who are also thinking about the bounds of, of academic practice. And I think so much about even the structure of the syllabus itself as a form of power and control over certain kinds of knowledge and the organization and patterns with which we come to approach ideas and people and, you know, Perhaps we could share a little bit. I mean, I won't, I won't bring you into this with a we statement. I'll use an I statement and you can choose your own adventure. But I really left thinking a lot about the final session that we had where we laid the grading rubric out for critical examination with our students and allowed them opportunity and space without critique or judgment to think about what it means to get an A, to get a B, to get a C. And what emerged from that conversation were all of the limits of our frame, right? The ways in which we are beholden to a University of Victoria structure of evaluation, all of the ways in which that actually exists as antithetical to the feminist art field school commitments that we had been building together over the course of the 12 weeks and to really sit in the murkiness and discomfort of that space with our students and in reading the evaluations that came in after I was really compelled by the ways in which that exercise for students served as a striking capstone to think about all of the work that is left to be done and how the field school is just one way in which we're trying to approach these questions and these systems. And, you know, I'm curious as we've had some time to 
to pause and reflect if you were to do the field school again or we were to do the field school again together are the things that you would immediately be excited to do over or are the things that you would immediately seek to change or amend based on your experience in a way that's a, a really complicated question but it does tweak something in my brain that i'd been thinking about earlier in the conversation which is how how specific the time in which we delivered the school was it was the fall of 21 so we'd all been at home for a year and a half when we started and you know i think i feel as though we offered the students a space that maybe they really needed at that time i mean we all needed it i do wonder you know if it was to be offered in two years with a little bit of distance from the pandemic whether there would whether there would be as much immediate acceptance for that sort of distance from the norm of the institution. <laughs> I love the phrase that distance from the norm. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's the subtitle of our class. <laughs> um, I think what I'm trying to say is that there's not a lot that I would do differently, or I would hope that almost everything we did, I could have an opportunity to do again. And what I'm questioning is whether it would be received in the same in the same way at a different time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it would not. I think that the the ways in which that information and that work, that's one of the reasons why I love art and cultural production is because the context in which one encounters it continually changes its meaning. That's why we can pull things out of collections and reimagine and restage in different contexts through a radical juxtaposition with other work and other artists and other sociopolitical contexts and all of a sudden see something new or see something again. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is making more space for the opportunity for students to encounter each other's work. So one of the foundational commitments of the field school were various structured opportunities for students to engage in creative practice and creative institutional critique. And I know that many of the students took risks to try different forms and genres and techniques in the structure of the class. And I think an opportunity to bear witness and be present and to engage perhaps in person would be such a welcome opportunity. I remember in our early conversations about the field school, we had talked about a kind of final exhibition, a way in which to share space, a way in which to, to have an opening. And I think that there's a kind of witnessing and audience and spectatorship that is difficult to maneuver and replicate in online formats, though I know some people are doing it well. But I would be curious to know what would happen if we were in person and able to take up space in a gallery setting in a different way. <clears throat> it's interesting because as you were talking about the um, conversation around the marking rubric and, you know, the implications of that in terms of what it means for helping students recognize that there's a, a system imposed on their experience of post-secondary education. I was thinking through what the parallel is in the museum field. And the interesting thing is that nobody's marking anybody here. If coming to the gallery or the museum, experiencing the exhibitions is the equivalent of participating in the feminist art field school, then sort of the limitation is what opportunities for engagement we're offering. And this has been, you know, sort of the ongoing struggle in particularly in art museums and contemporary art museums and other kinds of spaces, as opposed to history museums or science museums, which are very good at engagement. We tend to present exhibitions in a, a kind of old school art history way where the student is supposed to come into the museum and recognize things immediately and get very little help to engage. So our challenge is more about creating a space that is comparable to the opportunities for participating in a conversation around content that we offered in the field school, 
And I think where the parallel does exist to that kind of issue around a marking system in a university is that we haven't been very transparent about the message that you can come to the museum and leave the museum with your own opinions about what you've seen, that if you didn't like it, it's not a failure. If you didn't understand it, that's our fault, not your fault. So I think the the field school as a collaboration between academia and the museum world offers a really interesting opportunity for creating these comparisons that have been really useful for me in thinking in thinking through how how people engage, how people learn, how people find enjoyment in art. I love this. Anything else we want to I mean, I feel like that's wonderful. Is there is, is there anything that we should sort of touch on that we haven't? I'm trying to think, you know, the goal of the podcast would hopefully be that they would hear our voices and then maybe want to hop over to the feminist start field school project page on the AGGV website and click through the 10 public facing lectures that are hosted on the gallery YouTube channel and engage in a little bit of choose your own adventure. Yeah. So I wonder maybe if one, one last question could be, um, now I don't know how to how to articulate this because we had so many great guests and I can recall that every week I said oh I think this was my favorite guest (laughs) (laughs) so were you gonna ask me to pick a favorite (laughs) yeah and then I realized I can't (laughs) ask that they were we loved all of our children equally yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, the one thing that is notable to me as we wrap up our conversation is that a missing representation from our field school archive are the extraordinary students who are in our room each week. That, in fact, the trace of the field school is without its core collaborators. And there's something quite striking to me about that realization. And something that I'm going to think about long after we log off is. I wonder if in a future iteration, there's opportunity to make present more of the dynamic engagement because the conversations had in that room and in those rooms were so dynamic and so nimble and ever-changing. And maybe there's something there for us to consider about how to further connect what's happening in the Zoom room of the field school through the institution and the public facing classroom of the gallery and to further those connections. Well, tying that back to what I was just saying about museums engaging with audiences, I don't think I've ever seen a a so-called audience, if that's what we want to call that group of remarkable students engage so willingly and actively and honestly, you know, we were meeting with people every week who were dealing with the pandemic, dealing with being displaced from the experience that they thought they were going to be having as, as university students. And they listened to commentary from some really senior and important artists and curators and had their own opinions and were willing to say things that challenged what they heard. They were really sort of the ideal art engagers to me. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't (laughs) agree more. And I really could not be more grateful for the opportunity to continue journeying with you in these conversations. Me too. I am hopefully going to be teaching feminist art again, but it won't be the same without you. (laughs) Oh, well, sign me up for that class. Sounds awesome. (laughs) Well, Michelle, it is always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And thanks to everyone who joined us for another episode of the Work in Progress podcast. And thank you, Chase. Um, I miss speaking to you every week. So it was a pleasure to get together again. For those of you who want to learn more about the field school, visit aggv.ca and head over to the Feminist Art Field School project page, or check out the gallery's YouTube channel to rewatch all 10 of the public facing lectures in this exciting series.